Good morning from Washington, D.C., and good afternoon to our colleagues across the continent. We are delighted to welcome many Africa Center alumni and others who have joined us today for our first webinar on the emerging cyber dimensions of Africa's security landscape. My name is Nate Allen, and I am the Assistant Professor of Security Studies here at the Africa Center. I am the Africa Center's faculty lead on cyber issues, and I will be moderating today's webinar. I'm looking forward to a very fascinating discussion on some of, with some of the continent's leading experts on how the spread of digital technology is impacting national security across Africa. This webinar will be the first in a series of quarterly webinars we will be hosting on the emerging cyber dimensions of Africa's security landscape. And while this session is gonna help us get a better sense of the underlying technologies and trends that are impacting African security, in future sessions, we hope to drill down further on how key national security actors like nation states, organized criminal networks, and extremist groups are being affected by the spread of digital technology. But before we formally begin, I'd like to briefly turn things over to Kate Omquist-Noft, Kate Omquist-Noft, the director of the center, who will say a few words about the objectives of today's webinar and the broader context of the Africa Center's work. Kate, over to you. Thank you, Nate, and uh, my thanks to all who are attending the webinar today, uh, which we hope will be the beginning of a robust African community of practice dedicated to expanding understanding and holistically addressing the growing cyber dimensions of the challenges faced by national security actors across the continent. Participants in this webinar have many uh, different backgrounds and levels of knowledge on cybersecurity issues, and so we encourage all to ask questions and to engage with our experts you know, so that that we may uh, all increase our understanding of how the spread of digital technology is impacting na African national security. Uh, as many of you already know the Africa Center, uh, we are a US Department of Defense academic institution located at the National Defense University in Washington, DC. You know, the center serves as a forum for research, for academic programs, and for the exchange of ideas with the aim of enhancing citizen security by strengthening the effectiveness and accountability of African institutions. Uh, we do this the, through our uh, four uh, aspects of our mission, uh, which is to expand understanding, to provide a, a trusted and uh, 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 candid place for dialogue, uh, such as this webinar, through building enduring relationships with each other, uh, and catalyzing strategic solutions. And so uh, my thanks to Nate and to our expert panelists uh, for kicking us off on this uh, cyber uh, security series and uh, for uh, taking us down the path of expanding our understanding uh, first and foremost on how digital technology is affecting national security and citizen security on the continent. Thanks, Nate, back to you. Thank you very much, Kate. Uh, so as a first step in understanding the cyber dimensions of African security, today we're going to focus on how the spread of digital technology is changing the nature of the continent's national security challenges and threats. And we have four primary learning objectives today. First, we want to help expand understanding of the key technological and geopolitical trends driving Africa's digital revolution, specifically those that are of most concern to national security professionals. Second, we want to explore the main ways in which rising internet penetration, technological innovation, and the diffusion of cyber capabilities are influencing Africa's national security landscape. Uh, third, we want to discuss and consider how the COVID-19 pandemic is affecting the digital revolution and how that's impacting African security. And finally, we want to begin to identify the cyber capabilities and intentions of key national security actors like states, criminal networks, and extremist groups. For more information about this webinar, as well as the Africa Center Cyber Program, please visit our newly launched website at the following link that is going to be provided in the Zoom chat. And so before I turn to the panelists, a couple of brief ground rules. Uh, this is a webinar format. Uh, meaning we will adopt and use a conversational style rather than a presentation format. And we're going to be guided by, by questions to trigger and, and, and probe the conversation with the panelists. Um, after finishing my conversation, we'll open it up to Q&A. And because the webinar format does not allow you to appear on camera, once again, please everyone uh, put their questions in the Zoom chat. Um, and you can type them in at any time, and we will take questions in English, French, Portuguese, and then our team will process the questions um, and I will ask them 
uh, to, and we want to get through as many questions as possible. Um, and again, this conversation is on the record. It will be recorded in its entirety and posted on our website. You're free to use the information you receive here. Um, so now I'm, I'm very pleased to welcome two of the continent's leading experts on how cyber issues are impacting national security. Um, as you have their bios, I will highlight just some relevant aspects of their experience. Um, Mr. Abdul Hakim Ajijola routinely advises the highest levels of government, international organizations, and the private sector on cybersecurity policy and strategy. He is the chair of the African Union Cybersecurity Expert Group a commissioner of the Global Commission for the Stability of Cyberspace and is executive chairman of Consultancy Support Services Limited, a cybersecurity consultancy firm based in Abuja. He formerly worked at the Office of the National Security Advisor in Nigeria, where he played leading roles in developing Nigeria's national ICT policy, technology sector strategic planning, and setting up the, uh, the country's national computer emergency response team. He recently ranked number 13 in the IFSEC's 2018 list of global cybersecurity professional influencers and thought leaders. Um, next, we have with us Ms. Noelle van der Waag Cowling. She is a lecturer and researcher in the Department of Strategic Studies at Stellenbosch University, where she specializes in cyber strategy, warfare, and asymmetric armed conflict. She has been at Stellenbosch for over 20 years serving as chair of the School of Geospatial Studies and Information Systems, as well as program lead for cyber at the university's Security Institute for Governance and Leadership in Africa. She has published widely on cyber strategy and conflict in Africa, contributed to numerous peer review journals, and organized and hosted a number of international conferences and events. Um, she was recently selected as one of the 50 most influential female cybersecurity professionals in Africa. So we're absolutely delighted to have the both of you here with us to benefit from your many years of experience and expertise. Um, so the first question is gonna to go to you, uh, Abdul Hakim. We've seen massive growth in internet penetration across the African continent over the past two decades from around 5% in 2005 to close to 30% today to as much as 75% of the continent by 2030. Um, Yet as the reach of digital technology expands, as, as we know, so do the vulnerabilities. All computer networks are vulnerable to malicious attempts to violate in confidentiality, block access to them, or, or manipulate the data and information that they contain. So what kinds of threats and vulnerabilities do you see uh, arising, both the national security and, and citizen security, um, as a result of expanding internet penetration across it? Uh, thank you, Nate, and uh, thank you, uh, you know, colleagues, for the honor of inviting uh, me to come and uh, share a few thoughts. Uh, very quickly, uh, the reason why uh, these threats and vulnerabilities are becoming important is, as you said, the, due to the proliferation. But what the proliferation does really is that it increases uh, our dependencies. So it's because of our dependencies that these things are important. So when we look at the cyber threat space, we, we see a couple of uh, very uh, key areas of, of interest, especially national security interest. Uh, first and foremost are the attacks on physical systems. So very specifically damage to infrastructure due to sabotage, uh, vandalism, or, or even carelessness in some cases. We also have uh, authentication and privilege attacks, which often are by insiders, uh, such as disgruntled employees. Uh, we also have what we call denial of service attack, basically uh, blocked access to the services. Uh, this is often, uh, you know, perpetrated by sometimes by hacktivists uh, who are hackers who are also uh, political activists, and also the uh, issue of single point of failure of infrastructure or even organizations. So an example of a single point of failure in Africa would be electricity. And then, of course, we have global risks. Uh, we talk about cyber terrorism, uh, non-state actors in cyberspace, uh, as we've seen with the hacktivists I mentioned earlier, but also the pandemics, uh, COVID-19, Ebola, et cetera. Uh, then uncontrolled digital currencies, which are used for money laundering, and in some cases, uh, terrorist financing. We've also seen uh, a number of uh, malicious uh, content uh, attacks. Uh, such as web application attacks. We've seen a number of um, 
uh, websites uh, defaced across Africa. Uh, I believe in an 11 month period uh, in Nigeria, uh, we've seen anywhere from uh, three to 3,500 uh, website uh, type of attack. So it, it, it's, it's not uh, small issues. We've also seen uh, the challenge of social engineering, very specifically fake news, uh, misinformation, hate speech, and basically using social media for uh, influence operations by many, many parties. Uh, then uh, we also have issues related to the value chain, such as you know, electrical power, as I mentioned earlier, uh, as a single point of, of, of failure, but also data leakage. Our, our handsets uh, inherently leak data, particularly to the, 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 the owners of the big tech, uh, the people who develop, for example, the operating system, uh, be they Android by Google or you know, Apple iOS. So it's, 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 it's not one manufacturer or one producer or the other. And so the cyber threat space actually holds significant uh, national security uh, implications as frankly, they can undermine regimes, undermine governments. They can even uh, uh, potentially derail the nascent liberal democracies that we're endeavoring to, to, to build. And this is also very much the case with the social media challenges. Uh, more importantly, though, they can actually undermine trust in national institutions, uh, especially the national security establishment, and thereby leading to, uh, you know, uh, destabilization of public order and uh, uh, resulting in uh, situations where peace is lost. Uh, interestingly, these bad actors are all over the world um, and very strange characters and bedfellows. So we've seen bad actors leveraging cyberspace, such as Boko Haram, an Islamic State across the Sahel, uh, and especially in the West Africa region. But also, for example, within Nigeria, we've seen ethnic chauvinist groups uh, like MEN, the Movement for Emancipation of the Niger Delta, uh, IPOB um, uh, for Biafran Independence, the ROYU, uh, the OPC, which is a Yoruba uh, group. They all leverage in one way or the other uh, these technologies, sometimes to send out warnings, uh, sometimes to coordinate their activity. Uh, even as far away as Colombia, we've seen the FARC, and in Japan, we've seen onshore shooting. So it's not necessarily uh, an Africa-centric uh, know, problem. These are, these are global issues. And really, cyberspace, um, these bad actors use cyberspace as a way of leveraging their values, their propaganda, uh, financing, and recruitment. And so there are really three primary lenses through which many of them see cyberspace. First and foremost, as a tool to develop and disseminate, for example, their propaganda, but also as a medium uh, for their illicit activities, such as financial activities, mobilization planning, and of course, coordination. And finally, uh, these groups also see cyberspace and its infrastructure as a target, trying to take down the infrastructure uh, for example, the base stations, especially in, in rural areas. Uh, we've also seen them, uh, you know, try to attack the finance system and certainly uh, government services. Uh, that, having said all of that, um, all nations, all states also use uh, this technology, especially things like social media, for their own national security purposes and operations. Uh, we have cases where, for example, we've seen the Pentagon uh, manipulating social media for its own propaganda purposes. And so the question that I would uh, uh, leave for all of us to think about is, are African strategic decision makers, uh, are they ready to ensure that we find ways to out-recruit the bad actors, to out-employ them by es establishing sustainable indigenous cybersecurity solutions, maybe a small-scale enterprises, so that we actually get some of these people who otherwise would be bad actors to become empowered African knowledge workers developing solutions and not being part of the problem. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Abdul Hakim, for that very comprehensive response. I'd like to pick up a little bit on what you said around um, critical infrastructure, supply chain vulnerabilities, single points of failure. Um, you know, in recent years, we've actually seen the supply and building of information and communication technology become a source of interstate tension, competition, rivalry. Um, 
No, yet, yet it's often far from clear what exactly constitutes critical infrastructure, um, how the expansion of digital technology makes critical infrastructure more vulnerable, and under what circumstances those kinds of really become core threats to state responsibilities and interests. Uh, Noel, I'd like you to unpack this for a bit, if you can. What kinds of security vulnerabilities exist in Africa's information and communications technology infrastructure? And that, that should be a concern to national security sector actors. And, and why has the building of ICT infrastructure more broadly become such a geopolitical flashpoint? Thanks, Nate. Um, I, th I think at the outset, it's important to say that, that much of what challenges Africa is what challenges the rest of the world in terms of ICT infrastructure. And secondly, I think the, it's, it's, one can talk about critical information infrastructure, but in these days that is so intertwined with just general national critical infrastructure as well. And I think when it's important to look at the two concepts as a whole. Um, because for a start, states need to understand their level of cyber dependency, African states too. And, and cyber dependency is, is, is very much married to how can you cope if part of your national critical infrastructure goes down? What, what is your redundancy planning? How quickly can you come back? So I think the, this, this is an important thing to understand. And what we've seen in Africa over the years has been not, not well integrated in infrastructure planning. Um, so you will get big infrastructure projects, but they'll largely take part on their own. Um, and in some ways that's provided a certain level of immunity because a lot of African infrastructure isn't deeply embedded in telecoms infrastructure at the moment, but that's changing and it's changing quite fast. So I think that that's the first thing to understand is what are we building and how is it connected? And we know that we all critical infrastructure all, all over the world sits on relatively open industrial control systems, SCADA networks, that type of thing, that were actually designed for openness of access. And that, that's, of course, the big problem. So working around this, when we look at African IT infrastructure, or tech infrastructure, if I can put it that way, I think... Um, you know, going back to what Abdul um, referred to is, is, is to, to a large extent, this has been built by uh, companies that are outside of Africa. And that's neither a good thing nor a bad thing. It's just it is as it is. But for governments, from a, from a security architecture point of view, the question is, how do we mitigate risk? Um, because one of the things I think that, that we need to acknowledge is that cyber is possibly one of the most politicized um, tools that exists today worldwide. So, so as soon as you are dealing with any type of information technology systems or, or, or software, anything, um, there's a cyber element and there's a national security element that comes into play. Um, in Africa, uh, I think you're seeing, you're seeing a bit of a tussle go out between major global players for both market share, but also for strategic advantage and political reach, soft power reach. And one of the ways that this is playing out is, is in the whole global struggle to get ahead in terms of 5G, I think specifically, quantum computing um, is, is another element, and so is artificial intelligence. These three sort of go together. And they all obviously pose a threat from a, from a cyber point of view. So um, I think of concern is where you see large infrastructure projects going down in Africa, IT infrastructure projects that are being carried out potentially by just one company um, or one or companies just from one state. I think, I think mixing it up and, and being, t uh, being perhaps agnostic in terms of the technology that you're laying down is quite important so that nobody sits with the entire piece of the puzzle. This, this, is, this, is, this is quite a big thing. Um, I'll come to some of the other issues later, like cyber governance, but just in, uh, I don't want to run over my time, but I do want to say that there's, there's two critical issues here. Um, when, when somebody lays down a network end to, end to end, they really got the opportunity to build a lot of back doors in there. Um, and I think that's a threat. The other problem is frequently these projects are financed through quite long-term um, uh, payment structures, um, but, but, but you know, it can be aligned with what we come to know as debt trap diplomacy. 
So you would, you would get, acquire this beautiful new network, but you've got to pay it off in 20 years. And if you don't, um, the, then the country that built, built that takes control of it, then you've really got a problem if, you're, if your entire national IT infrastructure is actually controlled by somebody else. So, and I think that that's something to be careful of. But the last thing I just want to say is, and I'm, I'm sure Abdul will talk about cyber diplomacy, but quickly in terms of tech diplomacy or technology diplomacy, Africa hasn't moved yet in this space sufficiently, I think. And that is learning to talk with the big tech, tech firms. Um, and, and the critical things here are they're going to be in the space. We need them, they need us. But it's about safeguarding our data sovereignty. It's about safeguarding African data subjects. Um, digital colonization, it's a, it's a threat, it's a problem. We need to work with it. And then also digital taxation regimes, making sure that African countries realize the taxation revenues from taxation of source. So th these, these are issues that we, we need to confront. Thanks, Nate. Thank you very much, uh, Noel. My next question is going to go back to you, Abdul Hakim. So another digital trend we're seeing, and in part driven by AI, which Noel mentioned, is expanding uh, 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 digital surveillance, um, which a lot of African governments are, are interested in investing in. We've seen many, many African states acquire monitoring and digital sur monitoring and surveillance technology, according to a recent report by Carnegie Endowment, advanced artificial intelligence driven surveillance capabilities have already been adopted in at least half a dozen African countries. So I'd like you to talk a little bit more about what advances have there been in digital monitoring and surveillance, and how do you foresee these advances beginning to affect uh, security outcomes in Africa over the coming decade? Okay. Uh Frankly, uh, there has been a significant um, uh, advancement. I, I, I don't want to use the word improvement. Uh, from a technological perspective, certainly uh, there, are, there are significant advancements, um, but I'm not sure if they necessarily improve the well-being of the, of the privacy and security of, of, of the individual. Now, having said that, um, you know, enhanced well-being of the, or en enhancing the well-being of the citizen is actually a cardinal function of, of, of government. And we also know that, um, you know, money influences politics and cybersecurity uh, enhances trust, which makes things work. Uh, so you, 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 find, you find that um, there, there are some fine lines between enhanced surveillance, which in some instance you need in order to build the trust so that things work. Um, for example, banking and finance is based on trust. But at the same time, uh, we find that sometimes uh, governments maybe go, try to go a little too far because when you want to encrypt backend uh, uh, encryption process or encrypted uh, processes at the backend, if you want to decrypt them, it actually undermines the capability of, uh, of society and especially uh, business to develop the kind of trust uh, and, and that it needs. So for example, when we look at the Africa Free Trade Agreement, um, it, uh, th that specific agreement really has nothing cybersecurity. And I, I think just to build on something Noel had said, uh, you know, when you, when you look at issues such as the safety and well-being of, of the individual, um, we're not doing as good a job as we ought to. Now, first of all, we have to understand that there is a positive uh, economic impact of what we are beginning to see across the continent because of these new technologies. Uh, M-Pesa, for example, in East Africa is something that is very, very, in, in, indeed, it's a template for the world. It's an example uh, uh, and a model for the world. Uh, but we've also seen and witnessed how vibrant ecosystems, and all this comes back to trust, uh, are actually thriving or developing across Africa and attracting the much needed foreign direct investment. Uh, so for example, in Nigeria, we've seen the two, recent $200 million investment in Paystack by the US uh, services giant called Stripe. 
uh, you know, for me, the, all of these things uh, demonstrate uh, that African cyber products and services are indeed uh, globally competitive. Uh, and we do have other models uh, which, which we are trying to implement, some which we may have learned from uh, other, other sectors or other nations. Uh, for example, in Nigeria, we have started implementing the Nigerian Data Protection Regulation, which is similar to the uh, European GDPR and the California uh, Consumer Privacy Act. Um, but the interesting thing about the model that we are using is that we are now outsourcing to the private sector some components of uh, its implementation. And that has actually led to a new class of at least 70 new uh, data protection organizations and almost 3,000 new professionals, bearing in mind uh, those data professionals and, and, and organizations uh, did not formally exist in the ecosystem prior to January 2019. So we've seen in just over, well, a year, almost two years now, a whole new sector has been created. And what's interesting is that this sector of professionals and organizations are not simply generating income which the government can tax, but they are also influencing government policy within the context of a liberal democracy by lobbying and, and the like. And so there are those kind of changes. Uh, the, the challenge is getting the balance uh, so that we don't go too far as a society. But having said that, if I may just say, framing is actually important because we must ask ourselves, is cybersecurity a national security in terms of security issue in the traditional sense? Or is it a digital economy vis-a-vis uh, -vis risk management issue? And so, for me, this is a conversation that each nation must hold internally, because once you decide which way you are going, uh, then this actually inf influences which sector should lead. And very quickly in closing, uh, related to this framing, our paradigms need to change. As a society uh, and societies across Africa, we really need to look at cybersecurity as a societal profit center, not just as a, an organizational cost center. I'll give you an example. As we speak today, 2020, the African cybersecurity solutions market for this year is about $2.32 billion and is expected to grow to about $4.6 billion by 2025. This creates an opportunity to establish sustainable indigenous cybersecurity solutions firms. Um, it, it gives an opportunity to create wealth, uh, to, to generate jobs and also indirectly government benefits by being able to tax that wealth and those who are working. And so that it sees revenue there. The question really goes back to something Noel had said. Um, you, you have to have these conversations, not just in my opinion with the big tech firms, but also with these smaller groups, because how far do you outsource if, what is effectively surveillance? And don't forget, if you have little firms in Africa basically doing some level of surveillance, um, how much control do you have over them? But I would say you, as an African um, strategic thinker or a strategic leader, um, people in the audience need to think, is it easier to hold an African firm accountable for its own surveillance, or is it easier to hold a firm like Google or Facebook who are based in California, subject to US uh, legislation, but more importantly, their ethos and thinking um, is more in tune with Southern California than possibly African values and culture. And this is important when you're trying to hold uh, some of these tech organizations accountable for some level of surveillance, which is outsourced because they, they are the ones who actually censor, for example, our our posts on, on, on social media, not government. So by default, um, these are the kind of uh, things that are going to happen and we must have uh, national conversations about this. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Abdul Kim. I think you raised kind of profound questions over kind of which parts of ICT and cyberspace should be a civilian versus a, a military responsibility. I think for things like critical infrastructure, for monitoring and surveillance, 
the right answer is far from clear. Um, you know, another aspect to kind of the spread of ICT and, and information technology is that there are strategic and, and military applications, right? We're in the midst of what could be called an open technological revolution, and it is being driven by advances and applications of, of ICT technology that's largely being driven by the private sector. Nevertheless, a lot of this technology is dual use, and it's increasingly being used by armed forces, both inside and outside of Africa, for military purposes. Uh, Noel, you've done a lot of thinking on this as a scholar of irregular warfare, and also have some experience on this from your purchase as faculty at Stellenbosch. So what impact are these dual use technologies like cyber capabilities, uh, 5G and artificial intelligence, but also, also drones uh, likely to have on military strategy operations and tactics across the continent uh, over the coming decade? Thanks, Nate. Um, yeah, I'm, I, I, I want to thank you, Kim, for putting on the table the whole the whole issue of you know differentiating between cyber security, which essentially has a, a both a crime as well as a, a um, civilian type of, of ambit, and then cyber warfare, which is far more you know on the level of um, nation states and and in terms of national strategic imperatives. And I think uh, that technology is possibly one of the biggest influences in the way armed forces around the world are going to restructure themselves um, and already are in the, in the decade to come. And Africa is no different. I think it's very difficult at this point to, 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 to break down where African states are in terms of their cyber warfare capability. And this is for a number of reasons. States generally don't, don't really talk about that. Um, what they're doing and, and how far down the line they are. But let's, let's have a look at some of, of the things that, that we know in general that, that all states would need to do. And, and again, this will align to where a state sort of fits in. Is it a medium power? Is it a, a superpower? You know, what do you need in, in your armory, basically? And I think um, as a point of departure, African armed forces in general are, are very uh, experienced in ongoing low intensity conflict. Um, very often conflict that's below the threshold of war um, has, has quite a, quite a, a wide ranging um, sort of civilian type of impact because it's, it's not fought in, in, in terms of front lines. So I think that many African armed forces should seek to build on this type of, of um, experience that they have in low intensity conflict because it, with, within our, our strategic uh, arena, as, uh, I would say that hybrid threats and gray warfare threats will be far more omnipresent than out and out cyber warfare type of attacks. So, you know, you you know, people talk about cyber Geddon or cyber Pearl Harbor. I really do think that an ongoing persistent gray warfare type of cyber threats are going to be quite pervasive. In terms of, of technologies that, that are currently being used and that will be used a lot more in the future, uh, I think drones uh, and UAVs um, offer immediate affordances both in terms of cost, but also in terms of places that they can be deployed and, and the type of information that you can get from there. Um, so they, they would, for the most part, yield a currently and provide some type of intelligence function, geolocation function, etc. But again, this feeds back to once you've harvested all this data, um, where are you warehousing that and how are you starting to work that data and make it work for you to deliver a bigger picture? So um, we're, seeing, we're seeing in conflicts, for example, like the Congo, um, the use of drones there. We also see drones entering African airspace from, from outside of Africa to conduct strikes, for example, on transnational terrorist camps um, deep within Africa. So there the question is, um, if they can do that there, they can do it to armed forces. So how do you start defending against that? And, and how do you start positioning yourself? The South African defense industry has been producing drones already, UAVs for, for almost 30 years. Um, and we continue to do that. And, and we have wide application of them, especially also in our border program um, and in, in anti-poaching. And you might think, well, that's not military, but in fact, in Africa, anti-poaching operations are very paramilitary, very quasi-military, simply because this takes place often in, in, in highly contested and very porous border type areas. 
And we know there are links between poachers and smugglers and transnational crime groups and the terrorist groups come into play as well. The other, the other big technology, of course, is sensors. Um, and we, we are seeing sensors deployed again, often in border roles um, and, you know, on the edge of networks, that type of thing. But again, one needs to be able to harvest the data from those sensors to accurately start uh, planning interventions. Um, and again, South Africa has a border operation it's, that's uh, known as Operation Corona, believe it or not. It's, um, it was named long before, before COVID came out, but uh, their sensors are, are, are quite an important um, factor in that. So, so you're seeing technologies there, but there's also going to be cyber warfare technologies that are deployed and and of immediate benefit there to African countries will be harvesting their geospatial intelligence and developing, of course, their open source intelligence capabilities. Um, having said that, on a parting note, I think what's really important is to start looking at um, cyber hygiene within your forces, cyber awareness, and social media policies and regulations. Um, these are things that are tripping militaries up quite a lot um, worldwide, um, aside from the normal hardening of networks and definitely uh, most weapons nowadays have a software component. So, so no military, there is no such thing as a low tech battle space. And, and African forces will, will, will get, get on top of these software issues as well. They will have to, if they're not already there. Thank you very much, Noel. I think that was a really excellent summary of how, concise summary of how states in particular are harnessing all of these emerging technologies. Um, we also know, however, that, that non-state actors are employing surveillance capabilities, drones, and other kind of ICT-based tactics to achieve their objectives, um, often with more agility than states. Um, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to kind of follow up and ask you to describe a little bit some, what some of those tactics are and, and to give your assessment of the degree to which um, the non-state criminal groups, the terrorist groups, and, 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 and others are outpacing the ability of state actors to regulate or monitor them. Um, how, are, how is the diffusion of cyber capabilities and expertise affecting the, the balance and power and influence between African states and, and non-state actors? That's to you, Noel, again. Oh, sorry. Okay. Well, I, I would say that um, from from the point of view of non-state actors what what is there, there are a lot of non-state actors in in the african space uh, in fact in all, all spaces i think certain things might set us aside somewhat um and i'll and i'll come to that now but but starting off there what what makes it i think difficult for us in in africa specifically is is i think there are some issues around governance and uh, when I talk about governance, uh, differentiating from government, I'm talking about how do, we, how do we apply regulations and controls to our IT infrastructure, to our networks, to our data storage? How, how do we govern what we have to, to render it or to mitigate against threat? And I think internet governance is also, also quite an important um, issue. Um, and I think um, that we really need to build far more functional um, suits and, and play out our pu public-private partnerships far better. This, this, is, this is, I think, a critical issue is, uh, worldwide is militaries and governments don't control cyberspace or their information even uh, in the same way that they, they used to. Everything travels for the most part over some private companies, network, software, routers, whatever. So these public-private partnerships are really essential um, also for cyber capacity building. So looking, looking at who the state actors are that, that can come into sometimes what may not be optimally governed spaces and what can they do um, I think we're seeing, from, from the point of view of non-state actors, we have transnational terrorist groups in, in Africa and we have organized crime groups. And what we do know is that these, are, these two, two elements are connected and they offer very sophisticated cyber capabilities, um, especially the international criminal syndicates often operating with hacking as a service, ransomware as a service, 
and between the two of them, they use they use um, um, various levers to push money back and forth and operate in tandem as and where necessary. Uh, I think what we do know is that that, that a lot of cyber attacks globally are not actually that sophisticated, though. Very often, it, uh, many cyber attacks come down to quite poor controls, like bad patch management, um, old redundant software that's no longer being updated or supported by by um, the manufacturer and a perhaps a nascent immature policy type of environment so so actors like this would would thrive but we also need to to understand that um hacking as a service and that type of thing very hard to to get around very hard to mitigate against because it comes to the level of sophistication um, but we also have insurgent groups in Africa that can, if they want to, purchase that hacking as a service, for example, in order to get an outcome. But then we have the, the bigger mixture in Africa, and that, that, is, that is states from outside of Africa who might be using non-state actors to further their means in a proxy warfare type of or proxy attack. And, and one such incident, for example, would be the Lazarus Group, well-known APT, who have consistently cleaned out a number of South African banks and, and other banks, I think Kenya as well, and move that money back to the, the state on, on whose behalf they operate. So, so we've got that environment. Then we have the hacktivist environment, um, which is quite vocal in, in, in Africa, especially groups like Anonymous Africa, um, and known well known for taking down government websites over and over again. But again, you'll, you'll frequently find that it's a basic thing like an expired SSL certificate that could have could have pre prevented that. So we, we have that. But lastly, we also have rising cyber vigilantism in Africa and um, cyber militias. And I think these, these are things that need to be watched in terms of non-state actors. And again, here, um, as Abdul said earlier, we look at influence operations and, and those, those can actually be far more damaging than, than physical cyber attacks. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Noel. So I, I think, um, you know, it's pretty clear that the way in which non-state actors are using digital technology is highly, highly disruptive. And if, if it, that weren't disruptive enough, um, we are in the middle of a COVID-19 pandemic that I'm sure is, is on everyone's mind. Um, I think it's pretty clear that even though while we have some promising news on the vaccine front, uh, the pandemic's economic and geopolitical aftershocks are gonna be felt for quite some time. And that it will also be felt in the domain of digital security and information security. So I'd like to ask the both of you, and if you could keep your remarks brief, because I'd like to get to questions for the audience. How do each of you think that the COVID-19 pandemic is likely to, spread, to affect the spread development and use of digital technology in Africa? And in what ways will this affect national security? And particularly, some of these kind of second and third order kind of consequences beyond the immediate kind of public health effects. We'll go to you, Abdul, in two minutes. Okay, uh, very quickly, bear with me. I, I would like to just go back to the issue of surveillance technology to build on uh, some of the things uh, that have just been said, which are very important. Uh, one area of great concern is election interference. Um, we have seen uh, attempts to hack the mind of the electorate uh, we have seen Cambridge and, uh, uh, Analytica, who admitted to UK Parliament of releasing false and gruesome videos to exacerbate tribal cleavages in, for example, the Nigerian uh, 2015 elections. And uh, as Noel has said, this is potentially more insidious than physical action. Um, so, you know, they try, th these bad actors actually, uh, in terms of the election system, there are two key areas that they, they, they look, uh, one, is to try and undermine the technology that supports elections, not just the technology of the Electoral Commission, but the technology of the political class and especially the government so that they can leak information. Um, the second thing uh, critically is that they use influence operations to hack the mind of the electorate, uh, which Cambridge Analytica has tried to use. And uh, we've seen in Nigeria, for example, where back in, I think, 2014 or so, at least four uh, state governors were alleged to have illegally acquired technologies that allowed them to conduct mass surveillance. 
For us in Nigeria, as a constitutional point, do they even have a right to do so? Uh, we saw the uh, cancellation of elections in Kenya um, and the rerun in 2017 because of alleged failure manipulation of electronic voting. So African strategic uh, decision makers really need to work on ensuring that they have appropriate incident response and recovery plans that include communication strategies. Um, they also have to determine what assets are most valuable uh, to protect. And of course, uh, they need to start with greater transparency and enhanced accountability for Im improving communication with government itself. To your question on COVID-19, first of all, I think what COVID-19 has done is that it has forced a certain level of humility of man against nature. We've seen very strange human responses such as stocking up on toilet roll. Um, and you know, we may wonder why, what, what's the cyber in this? The, the point is that it's the strange response. Um, COVID-19 has actually accelerated the existing trends um, and really has been a, a test of our extant policies, legislation, strategies, systems, organizations, and even the cyber uh, professionals by forcing all of us to prioritize what we think is really important and how to mitigate the influx of a wide variety you know, of electronically driven pandemic related scams. Uh, it's also highlighted the vulnerability, for example, of our mobile telephones, which are in effect unsecured endpoints. Um, we've seen malware across Africa from relatively low cost phones that are not removable because they were put in the supply chain or, or the value chain that developed the product. And therefore the end user, not only is the end user paying very high price for data, their data, their information is being stolen and transmitted at their expense over their data connectivity. And this begs the question, are African states preparing to fight and win a data facilitated cyber war to gain information advantage? We do need to ask ourselves that. And then given all these challenges, uh, we know that collaboration is, is the name of the game. Um, you know, the, even that African free trade, uh, continental free trade area that I spoke about, frankly, is a major target and also at the same time, a threat vector that we really need to look at. And so addressing global malfeasance requires global multi-stakeholder collaboration. It starts within the countries. How do you bring the people together? You then need to link it to the region. You need to link it to the, uh, you know, African uh, Union and other institutions, because at the end of the day, the people, we, you and I, are actually the weak link. Um, finally, I just want to say that there are a number of ongoing challenges. Uh, you've seen the situation between America and China, China and India, America and Russia, Europe and America, Europe and, and Russia, and African leaders, uh, the strategic decision makers, you really need to find and think deeply about how we are going to thread our way because these geopolitical issues, be they um, you know, the, the, the border clashes or whatever, are actually impinging on these technologies, cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, uh, drones, uh, you know. And so where I would ask African strategic leaders to think is, first of all, let's define our philosophy. That for all of these technologies, you know, each of these technologies, let's define our ethics, our principles, and then it is based on those philosophies, ethics, and principles that we can now build our policies and strategies. And so, Africa, please understand the we are in a multipolar world of technology, and in the long term, the best way to 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 hedge our bets is to build our own indigenous capacities but we need to still proactively monitor and navigate very complex and very economic, commercial, political, technological privacy and connectivity relationships as they uh, relate to cyberspace. It requires research and development, but really it's also uh, as alluding to something Noel had said, mixing technology and developing and implementing robust vetting mechanisms. I, th I think these are the things we really need to think about. Thank you. Thank you for such a, a rich uh, discussion on, on all of our behalfs, uh, Noel and Abdul Abkeem. Um, you've greatly helped increase my understanding of how the spread of digital technology 
is affecting national security. Um, you know, I, I think it's very, very clear from both of your remarks that, that um, the cyber issues are and are having and, and will continue to have very profound national security implications um, over across the continent in the coming decade. We've heard how cyberspace is giving rise or amplifying to new forms of espionage and surveillance, be it from kind of tech companies or kind of foreign suppliers, uh, new possibilities when it comes to critical infrastructure sabotage, um, and new forms of cyber dependent and cyber enabled organized crime, uh, terrorist activity. Um, and we've also heard how ICT and related technologies are fundamentally beginning to transform uh, the battlefield strategies, operations, and tactics. Um, these trends are only likely to accelerate over the coming decade as internet penetration increases, as technologies continue to improve. And we're also seeing how the spread of cyberspace is disrupting balances of power, capabilities, and threats posed by a variety of state and non-state actors. Um, these are topics that we're going to hope to unpack in future webinars. Um, I hope you will join us and spread the word. Um, and, and thank you very, very much to all of our, our participants in this webinar and to our panelists for all uh, uh, their contributions. Thank you.